change things up just a little bit. I want to introduce uh, Nick Lewis, who is the Executive Director of Glen Helen here. We want to thank him very much for hosting us tonight in the hype. I want to give him a few minutes to say a few things about Glen Helen. Unfortunately, he's got to run to a board meeting, so we're going to get him on first and, and get on to uh, other important duties.
the uh, partners of the environment. Uh, and I want to introduce the rest of the steering committee, which makes um, all the, a lot of the effort in all of this happen uh, on, a, on an annual basis. So I'm going to introduce uh, Sarah Hickensteel Hall, my co uh, co chair. Money, um, I think, uh, 
rates are typically in the $5,000, $10,000. And uh, we look for organizations, initiatives, projects that will support the stated purpose of the conservation fund, which is to maintain and enhance the treasure that is our natural environment in this area. We will have our grant applications for 2024 available early January, uh, whatever the first working day in January is. And the deadline for submitting an application is uh, March 31. So if you're interested, uh, contact the Foundation for uh, the application or talk to Meg, me, or any other member of the uh, conservation club. So thank you very much, and we're delighted to sponsor. Is 
grant writing. And so um, we did the best we could to try to bring those um, opportunities to us. The last one that we applied for is, uh, we've been told actually we might be on a waiting list for Mosaic, and they had thousands of applicants. So, you know, we're competing uh, in a very large pool. So we're still hopeful that um, we can do that kind of work together. As we uh, move away from Sochi as our fiscal agent, we are going to go back to a funding uh, or a administrative model where we hire a part-time staff person. That has worked well for us in the past. That helps, that person will help us schedule and manage trainings and workshops and joint uh, events, uh, potentially more grant applications. We are talking about potentially um, launching another cohort of the Greater Dayton Environmental Leader Development Program, um, but we need a, a part-time staff person to do that. So we will be making an announcement and recruiting. If you know of anyone that would like to pick up a few hours, um, we definitely will guide them along the way, and we just need somebody that's enthusiastic about helping um, helping this organization thrive. So, for the last year, we recruited, we went back and worked with one of our national expert partners, the Institute for Conservation Leadership. They help organizations all over the country become healthier and more successful. And so they help with board development, and they help you train to be better fundraisers, and they help you partner or develop networks or coalitions more effectively. And over the years, they've supplied some of our trainings, uh, if you'll remember, or they've brought um, people in to, during COVID, we pivoted, we were active. We had uh, Joy Jackson do a series of online Zoom trainings. So they've really been a great partner. We turned to them and said, okay, we need help um, re-energizing our members. We need help fostering more involvement and a greater level of collaboration amongst our, our individual organizations to make more of a significant impact. So that was our ask. And so they worked with us for about six months to propose steps that we could take to make our organization stronger. And one of those things was to hold more events, actually. And so many of you came to our event at um, Allwood, and uh, we had another event at Cox Arboretum, and very successful. And so we've been just trying out new things and seeing what our members need and want from us. And so to that end, on the very back of your program is a QR code to help to a little survey that will help us understand what you want now. Wait, the last question on the survey got glitched up when we launched it. So we'll send you a new link. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get to that last question and be like, I don't understand what I'm supposed to say here. So feel free to do it now, but we're just going to make you do it again later. Because this, this organization is a partnership, and we're here to develop and build programs that benefit you. So the survey is to help us um, all work together better. Uh, there's also a survey on there, the second, the second to last page. Please do take that survey tonight. Don't wait. That's about this event and always making it better. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many faces that I've never seen before. We love uh, attracting new people. And so thank you so much if you've never been to this event before. We're, we're thrilled to have you and um, we, we hope you come back uh, again and again. I know Leanne's here. I would be remiss if I didn't say, this party was always her idea. There she is. She said, uh, can be really dis disheartening. There are wins, um, but there are also just a lot of hard work. And sometimes, like with those six grant applications, there's some not wins. So uh, Leanne said to us, you know, we need some time to just be able to celebrate the successes, be able to celebrate the people who are inspiring us. And so that is, it, it's, it's, it was always your idea. And so we've been doing that for 10 years, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. And so we're thrilled to have you um, here. Really excited to hear from our award winners. They are a super inspiring group of people who have been influencing their communities and, and really making a difference. And so 
Um, we're we're going to celebrate them in a minute. Um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Did I forget anything here? This is amazing for us. <laughs> I don't know what to do. You can dance. Um, a challenge. Uh, so I would just say that um, I heard Dr. Wilson speak before, and uh, I was okay. Uh, uh, we together. You spoke to the Ohio watershed leaders, or maybe it was um, Ohio leader development. Anyway, and it changed. I do a lot of speaking engagements, a lot, and it changed everything I do about how I present myself and my topic to the people that I'm speaking to. It was a real pivot for me. So I think you're really going to um, get a lot out of what he says, and we're thrilled to have you here tonight, and I would introduce Dr. Aaron Wilson. Thank you. 
a good job for forecasting. <laughs> we, make, uh, we, we, we have instruments and a lot of measurements. We've been measuring temperature for a very long time. But as, as scientists, right, figures like this graph that you see here, they don't tell a story, per se. They do to me. You know, that's what I'm trained to look for. We're all trained to look at the data that we're used to. But what's really important is we've got to take that information and we have to make it useful and usable to our communities, all of our communities. It doesn't matter if we're teachers, architects. Uh, it really matters how we translate that information. And I think that's really the key to engaging on the topic of weather and climate. Now, it always strikes me funny. Weather is something that pulls us all together, right? We romanticize about it. We, we rally in our communities when an event comes through, like a tornado or, or a hurricane or a flood. But the flip side are similar, you know, when we think about climate, it's something that often can drive us apart. And I've always thought about that in terms of thinking about the differences here between weather and climate. So let's do something awesome and look at our awesome Earth here from a broader view. And so this is a, a simulation and, and um, uh, satellite images brought together to depict basically weather patterns over a particular period uh, on the Earth here. So the orange is dust coming off the African continent. Uh, the blue that you see, these are sea salt particles. So all of these are aerosols, tiny droplets, liquid or solid particles. We've got volcanic emissions in white, and you'll eventually see some green on here, and that's carbon coming from fires. So let's imagine yesterday, right? I got up, it was 42 degrees in London, Ohio, when it was. By the afternoon, we were close to 70. Last night, we dropped back down to 55, right? And that's pretty common. We see 20, 30, 40 degree temperature changes in a day. That's the chaotic nature of weather, the ups and downs. And we live on that scale. That's how we operate, right? Our lives are kind of on that time scale of weather happening. It's always happening constantly around us. But animations like this help us to kind of pull back and do a couple of things. One, get us out of our place in Ohio. We look at other places in the world. And two, it, it shows that we're, all of these really rapid change in the, in, changes in the weather are part of a larger and a pattern that, by the way, connects us to every other point on the world. Right? We are not distant from Antarctica. Right? What happens in Antarctica impacts what happens in other places in the world. What happens in the Arctic impacts us here. And what we do in the weather that occurs here in Ohio impacts others across the entire globe. And I think it's really important to have an opportunity like this just to pull back and, and one, admire this great earth. And, and the weather patterns, I'm a little biased, right? But just, you know, just to admire those conditions, but to know how connected we really are. We know how connected we're, we are to Canada this year, and wildfires, right? So we had a tremendous amount of wildfire smoke. This is a satellite image from July. The bright white are clouds, but that hazy, beige color, that was wildfire smoke brought directly down Brought us a beautiful summer, northerly flow, cooler than average temperatures this summer. Also brought the wildfires. I like this animation as well. It's just so captivating to watch these things. Huge systems spinning over southern Michigan. We've got clouds that actually gave us a lower uh, amount of wildfire smoke this particular day, but it rushed right back in. You can see all the smoke wrapping around uh, the backside of this system, right? So weather, man, weather is amazing, right? It's absolutely amazing what it does. So what happened in Canada did not stay in Canada. The wildfires did not stay. Uh, this is the uh, daily air quality index values for PM 2.5. 2.5 referring to size of molecules here. Uh, this is uh, from a Montgomery County site close by. Uh, the range, the 20-year high and low is given, if you can see it, in the light blue range. The five-year average is the dark line. And the, and the dark blue, these, that's the quality, the air quality values PM 2.5 this year. So not only was it unhealthy for sensitive groups, but it was unhealthy for all of us, right? And because those fires were close and it brought that, you know, the northerly wind flow brought us down, we had unhealthy air quality here right in Ohio. And, it, and, and impacted by that, very much impacted by that. Again, we're connected to other areas of the world. So again, part of what I want to do tonight is, is kind of at least do some of the information that I generally provide with weather and climate, but then get it 
more of the communication of that, communication of that, those facts as well. And so I've slimmed this down. If anybody asks me how long do you want to speak, and I'm like two minutes or two hours, you take your pick, right? We can we can do it all. So we're going to do 30 minutes today. But if we look at Ohio, let's let's just put us in the weather and think about this year so far, September 12th at least. It has been a warmer than average year for Big Four Ohio. Okay. Uh, if you look around this region where we are right now, it's close to average. Uh, a little bit farther west, close to Montgomery, Pebble County, it's a little bit above average. But generally for the state, it's been above average. Uh, we've also been a bit drier than average. There's pockets of weather than average down here in southwest Ohio. Ohio, much wetter across north central Ohio, largely due to some bigger rain events in August. But this is actually the ninth warmest year on record going back to 1895. So 129-year record. It's the 39th wettest, right? But if you ask folks down, you can even think, is it a wet year? So even a state statistic doesn't necessarily capture what you experience where you live. And it's really important to delineate these. So let's zoom in on Dayton. I picked on Dayton a little bit here. We're going to do it both for precipitation, uh, temperature, and then eventually precipitation. This is what it actually looked like for Dayton International Airport. So the gray bars, the range, the high, the low, record highs are for the day are in red, record lows in blue. Green is the typical 30-year average. So when you start to look at the chaotic nature and the variability, you can see we generally had no winter cold last year. Right? We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, by the way, Dayton hit 70 degrees for the first time in the month of February. Three times. Right? That beat the old record of two, but three times. In some areas, we're pushing well above that. Right? We did have some near record or cooler spring conditions at times, and some near record warm in spring as well. Right? And you'll see what the season looks like when you do that, right? Hot month, cold month, divide by two, we get an average. That's how statistics work. When we get into summer, it's been a mild summer. It's been cooler than average in the right? So that's what we've actually experienced. And that's really important, I think, when we talk about the weather and climate. This is what our seasons look like. This was winter, so uh, red means hot, okay? Six to seven degrees above average for winter. Second warmest winter on record for Ohio going back to 1895. The only warmer winter was 1931 and 32. Okay? Here's our average spring. Right? We draw a line through the middle. And then here's our basically our cooler than average summer, about one to two degrees. Okay? Cooler summer, hottest. August on record for the entire world. Going back to 1874 year record. August was the warmest August. January or June through August was the warmest summer for the globe. Not for us, but for the globe. It was warmer, uh, the warmest summer on record. Uh, so far for this year, January through August, uh, we are on pace of the second warmest winter, sorry, second warmest year on record over 174 years. So these are facts, right? Scientific facts. This is how we measure. These are uh, the, 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 the statistics that are taking place. But we obviously want to go eventually beyond that, right? Uh, let's look at the precipitation side. Now, how many days a year do we see at least a trace of precipitation in Southwest Ohio? More or fewer than 150 days? More. About 180, 190. Some years we see 200 days of at least a trace of rainfall. So here in Dayton, in a dry year, dry end, right, 28.74 inches of rain through a couple of days ago, almost 40% of that's fallen in just seven days. Seven days. So a big portion of our rainfall falls in a few days, and that statistic is changing. That's a big impact right here in the Mormon Valley. This is what the seasons look like. I use the word whiplash. Right? Weather whiplash. We see a lot of weather whiplash here. Uh, depending on your area, now this area has been close to average and slightly drier, right? But northwest Ohio, very wet winter, very dry spring, a dry summer. And so what we, we've seen in, in some of our conditions with the, with the precip is a lot of oscillating back and forth very rapidly. Um, and that's what we see here in Ohio. So let's take a step back again and think about climate. Transitioning from weather to climate. And I always love using this video. How many dog lovers? <laughs> so you're out walking your dog. You know that dog. 
box driven by its own internal variability, its own chaotic nature, right? Fire hydrants, McDonald's wrappers, dogs on the other side of the street, cat, squirrel, whatever, that dog could be moving the opposite direction that the dog walker is moving, but we still expect them both to be in roughly the same location. What do we base that decision, that, that information on? Path that the dog walker is So statistically, the mean path of the dog can be described by the dog walker. So what we do is we think of weather like the dog. Okay, all right, back. You're the dog walker, right? And you're related, I and mean, you're moving in a similar direction, but you can be moving in the opposite direction at any given moment. Now remember, two degree, you know, second warmest winter on record, December 23rd, right? Okay. So that's how they're, they're related to each other. I think it's a really powerful illustration of, of these two. So from a, from a climate walker perspective, what does it look like? Well, 2022 is the sixth warmest, so let's do a whole year. Sixth warmest year on record. Raise your hand if you were born after February of 1985. <laughs> <laughs> so you've never experienced the cooler than average month for the planet? No. Been more than okay. Top ten warmest years have all occurred since 2010, and you can bet it will be the top third warmest this year. Somewhere in the top three. Okay. The last decade is also the warmer is warmer according to a lot of records. Now, when we go back before uh, temperature records, we rely on ice core proxies and sediment proxies. But to the best of our knowledge, the last decade is the warmest decade in any other multi-century century period in the last 125,000 years, right? But not all regions have warmed equally. And that's really what this map over here on the right is showing, this accelerated warming, right? Uh, accelerated warming. Why should we care? And this is part of this describing why should we care about this issue? Well, 38 years old, we've never experienced a cold than ever things are accelerating, it feels like we're on a really fast pace for big changes, maybe not so great changes, so we've got to do something, right? We can look at, uh, again, another graph that just shows the dog walking back and forth. This is the United States temperature, average temperature every year since 1895. And what you'll notice, the 1930s, still a warm decade for the United States. Dust Bowl era, 34, 36, still hold our summer daytime record highs. The 60s and 70s, yeah, you guys have a lot of snow, rub it in, right? Um, you had the blizzard of 78, everybody talks about. By the way, I've had three bigger snowstorms than 1978, but didn't have the wind. I wish, I wish I could have been there, but I was born in the other blizzard of the late 70s, one year later. I call it the other blizzard of 1970. Uh, but we've been warming ever since, and even our coolest years, you can see here on the end of the graph, are warmer than most of the years of the 20th century. So there's no doubt that, that we're warming here across the United States. And if we take a difference between just over the last 40 years, the last two normal periods that the, the National Weather Service has used, so it's 1991 to 2020 minus the previous 30 years, this is what the temperature change is, has happened across the United States. So we're warmer here in Ohio, but not everywhere is warmer. The upper Great Plains have actually cooled over the last 40 years in terms of their annual temperature. Interesting, right? It's not exactly linear. Um, we can show the same thing for precip, but I'll just jump to the seasonal precipitation because I think that's something that matters here in Miami Valley. Changing seasonal distribution of rainfall. Winters are getting wetter. More rainfall, less rainfall during these seasons. Aprils and springs are getting wetter. So we're, we're seeing more spring rainfall and heavier rainfall as well. Our summers are getting drier. Right? And then we're fall, our falls are going back toward wetter conditions. So I talk a lot and engage a lot with the farming community in Ohio. It's a perfect season, right? A really wet spring, a really dry summer, a really wet fall. It's perfect for a production, right? Exactly, right? But what does it also do to other things, like our stream flows? Maybe even our summer fall stream flows. What impacts does that have on our cold water and our cold fish species and the ecology of trees? All these things that you can see the impacts from these changes in climate. And again, if I had you know two hours, I would like to look at all of it. 
The intensity of the rainfall is increasing as well, right? So what we know is in the last 20 years, anytime you hear one 100 year flood event, one 1,000 year flood event, that's all based on data that does not include the last 20, 25 years of data. Uh, First Street Foundation included that data and they've got their own methods for doing that and then looked at, well, what does that look like? How do we change a one 100 year flood event across the United States? And you see a lot of blue here in the eastern United States, especially in the mid-Atlantic, especially around Louisville, their average precipitation by about 12 inches since 1970. Right, so a tremendous amount of water and, and heavier rainfall events. Let's zoom in on Ohio. What do we see in this area? A 1 in 100 year flooding event is now occurring every 10 to 20 years. Right, so intense rainfall. That's the name of the game here in Ohio. Warmer temperatures, but intensity of the rainfall, increasing rainfall events. And that increases, you know, the impacts on our natural environment. It increases our flooding. These are examples from Columbus, but I can pull up uh, flooding here. I said we need fewer heights. All of our infrastructure that we're playing catch up in our infrastructure. Uh, even in our rural areas, right, we're playing catch up. We're seeing these increases in the intensity of the rainfall events. But we're also dealing with a lot more whiplash. Droughts and flash, what we call flash droughts. This is an excellent year as an example of that. Um, you know, we had a fairly dry late April and May, we had, but in mid-May we had 0% of the state covered in drought conditions. By June 13th we had 78% of the state in drought conditions, and a month later we were back down under 5%. So it's the flashiness of the drought, and that's increasing and changing as well. So again, these are just some of the, the overall kind of impacts that we're seeing right here in Ohio. So it's, it's much more than about temperature, right? much more than just a single impact, but it's really changing our, our, our hydrologic cycle, the water cycle on current is changing. Uh, we're increasing the water vapor with warmer temperatures, the evaporation rate increases, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere. Fronts come along and what do the fronts do? They do what fronts do. They squeeze out moisture from the atmosphere. Hurricanes squeeze out that atmosphere of moisture. So you see 65 inches of rain in four days along Port Arthur. Or five and a half inches of rain in Victor City, in Miami Valley. Right, two hours, five and a half inches of rain. How do we cope? How do we deal with that? So weather extremes, and you hear a lot about weather extremes, are really just the manifestations of a change in climate. What is weather trying to do? It, what, what the effects of weather are all about redistributing heat from the equator to the poles. That's what we. That's what weather is. What physically it's trying to do. So as we intensify moisture, intensify heat, we get more energy in the system. We get more billion-dollar weather disasters, and that we've seen that a big rise. We're at 23 this year, more than any year we've seen certainly since 1980. The mean since 1980 is eight per year, but a lot of our recent years have been are in the different colors that you see on the graph. But they're going to look different depending on where you live. If you look at these disasters. We don't see a lot of hurricane disasters here. Ike was the exception, right? We don't typically see a lot of the wildfire impacts here. We have some, but that's the west. That's what it looks like at the west. Sea level inundation, that's what the Maldives have to deal with. That's what the east coast of the United States is dealing with. This is what our communities in Florida are dealing with. We're dealing with the heavy rainfall and heavy precipitation events. So that's what's really changing. So it's important, I think, to talk about what is your face climate change. What is our face of climate change? Right? And that's going to be based on our geographic location, but also the communities that we're working with. So we can talk about futures and future projections, right? We can say a number like 3 to 5 degrees warmer by 2050, 4 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer by 2100. But what does that actually mean, right? The impact of what that means. We, we do expect warmer winters and warmer springs and or sorry, wetter winters and springs, but drier summers. But finding ways that we can encapsulate those, those changes. But think about Ohio's moving toward a mid-Atlantic winter and an Arkansas summer. Anybody been to Arkansas? Anybody from Arkansas? Right? I heard, I, I, I kind of talked today, and they used the word of this. Is it really that bad? But, yeah. It's warmer, warmer than average. Precip, a lot of spring, a lot in fall, less so, you know, it's a little dry in the summer. But this will have an impact, right? Because, you know, 
think about native species. What they're also not just native to the soil and native to the planet, they're native to the climate of a particular region. So thinking about the trends, this is I think a way to getting us thinking about how, how we're moving. So that's a, you know I think another effective way that we do this. Of course, all of this is about assessing risk and. Uh, you know, we can think about the temperature impacts, we can think about precipitation impacts. I think the top two bullets here are what we're dealing with in the Miami Valley. Uh, temperature increases mean higher demand for water and energy. That's increasing. But increased risk of damage to energy and water infrastructure is opposing that increase in demand. So both of those things are working together to increase that risk. But I think management of these rapid oscillations is something that we consider. Obviously, we want to talk a lot about you know water quality impacts. Um, I, I kind of quipped earlier, you know, over the last several years, we think all of our water goes to Lake Erie. Right? It doesn't. Right? A lot does not go to Lake Erie. We've got inland water bodies and rivers and things going to the Ohio River and down the Mississippi and the Gulf. So thinking about these impacts again, what happens here doesn't stay here. What we're doing impacts our communities all, all along our rivers. So it's important to kind of think about assessing that risk. Again, we could stop there and probably go into the next 45, 50 minutes of how, you know, those different types of, 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 of risks. But I would encourage you, when you're talking to your communities, identify those risks that are important to the communities that you're working with. And really kind of prioritize, hey, if I have to prioritize the assets or things that I want to preserve, work to do that and, and, and make those because then the next step needs to be what can you do? What can I do? What can we do? And I think this is a great illustration of that. Uh, uh, psychologist Elisa Mel, you know, from different spheres of influence and thinking about how we can impact, uh, you know, our behavior in terms of what we're doing and learning from the client. So, you know, as private, you know, you've got your individual person and, of course, private and personal learning, educating, understanding the system, Obviously, our, our pocketbooks, the books, and, and motor booths, and, and all of these different techniques that we can do. Our social network, you know, sharing goods, teaching others, and our expertise, right? I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself, you know, a knowledgeable in climate, but I can't be an architect. You know, I can't be a, a somebody that works with infrastructure and an engineer, but working with your expertise and sharing your expertise in this realm, I think, is really important. Getting into organizational, you know, thinking about sharing ideas among these collaborating partners, right? Change processes and procedures. Into the public, maybe taking these up and running for office on these platforms, or creating laws, voting, uh, or even any even culture. You know? We know that we can do a lot of the grassroots level, but we know some of this probably we're, we're asking for transformational change when it comes to adaptation and certainly mitigating. Uh, for, for climate change. So I think it's important to think about these different realms and these spheres of influence. What are our options? Well, we can, we can mitigate, right? Uh, stop or limit climate change impacts, reduce greenhouse gases and capturing them from the atmosphere. We can adapt, right? So we're changing the infrastructure, planning and behaviors, or ultimately we suffer. And what do we know about who suffers? It's not those with resources, nor the ones that have contributed largest to the problem. It's those that are more vulnerable and have fewer resources to adapt and to mitigate. Right? So I think that that's really important for you. Lean on, lean on, explore again about that education. Lean on a lot of tools that are available. Uh, the U.S. Resilience uh, Toolkit is a great learning tool with a lot of case studies of communities and organizations and nonprofits all over the country that have taken these steps to build resilience within their communities, right? And again, it's back to understanding what my local changes are. What, how am I being impacted by these changes? How can I assess the vulnerability and then prioritize my actions? It's really key to do that. If you want to get into the scientific nitty gritty, uh, the latest uh, inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, right? So there's a link provided there, and I certainly will make all the slides available. You know, from the physical change to how we adapt and how communities are adapting, and even into how do we mitigate. So I've had the pleasure of, over the last three years of being the 
lead author of the Midwest chapter of the upcoming National Climate Assessment that will be out later this year. And a lot of what we wanted to do is not only talk about the risk of the change in the Midwest, but what our communities are examples of things that are happening in our region already that are quote-unquote climate smart or building climate resilience. And so how can we do that, I think, is, is really important to think about. I think it's good to look, if you heard of the, uh, uh, the Six Americas study, right? Changing attitudes of, of global warming Six Americas here. Uh, from a scale of dismissive all the way to alarm. And what we know, this is as of April of 2020, but you can get the most up-to-date uh, at the link. And, and again, looking at, at, at this poll, it's, it's a long, long study here looking at attitudes on climate change. We've shifted a lot of disengaged out from dismissive toward cautious, concerned, and alarm. Right? Uh, contrary to maybe what we hear, and I'll, maybe I'll share that for a second, in a second, but there's a lot of like-mindedness in our community. There's a lot of like-mindedness in our communities. So don't be afraid to talk about it and reach out. I think that's really important. So again, we've seen that shift. So less alarmed, you know, fewer, fewer, you know, up, I should say, alarmed, but less of that dismissive, doubtful, and disengaged. You can pull data from your own counties and communities here. Estimated percent of adults who think global warming will harm future generations. Right here in the county that we're in, it's about 60 to 65 percent. The big majority of your fellow citizens in the community that guess what? Think global warming is harming our children and our future generations. Percentage of adults who support funding research into renewable energy sources. 86% for the state, and you can see this area is up over close to 90% of thinking about renewable resources, the mitigation power. Estimated percent of adults who discuss global warming at least occasionally, 35%. Right? So, we're not talking about it enough. We're not talking about it enough. And I think it really boils down in, in these 12 words, which are, are really great, uh, again, from the Center for Climate Change Communication. It's real, it's us, experts agree, it's bad. Here's the more important one. Others care. Others care. And there is hope. And that hope is in building that resilience. And, and again, realizing that you have a lot of like mindedness in the community. You just got to start talking about it. And I think once you start talking about it, it's a catalyst for other groups and other organizations to start talking about it as well, pulling in those resources uh, that's well demonstrated here tonight. So kind of the framing, it's all about framing. How an issue is framed tells us what kind of issue it is. That influences how much or how little we care about the issue. So it's, it's funny, I always think about these three terms, pathos, logos, ethos, right? Pathos appeals to the emotions. It's a story, and we're all involved, and it's all of us. So develop a story around those questions. Why do I care? And you share why you care with others. That then helps you know, kind of communicate why should the audience listen to what you have to say. Appeal to reason and facts and figures, right? Uh, present the science logically, articulate it in a manner that resonates. It's not just numbers, but it's why those numbers. Reach out to local experts, right? Reach out to, say, climatologists or, or resources. Uh, we are, are, we love to share. I love to share and engage, right? But also appeals to a greater good, right? Based on source credibility. What, what do we care about? Right? What do we do about this? Solution space. I, I heard the term solutionists. Our kids are like solutionists, right? And so thinking about that greater good goes a long way. So. With that, I'll go ahead and conclude my prepared remarks. Uh, just show you, by the way, the very first cold front coming into Columbus, downtown looking north. The very first cold front this summer that brought wildfire smoke to Ohio. Uh, so I thought it was a great capture to share. But thank you for your attention, and uh, it's been great to be here. Yeah. 
others, the IPCC report, the former. Yeah, so um, that's, if the, those are basically from NOAA, so uh, scientists within the NOAA organization. Um, I, uh, a lot of us, including myself, had a role in, in thinking about the Midwest and resilience and things like that. Uh, but a, a lot of it was spearheaded by authors in NOAA that reached out into the communities to get examples of resilience, how to build them, and, and adapt. And that's all available. There's a lot of information. Yeah. Other? I wonder if uh, the meteorologists said to give us weather reports, why can't they include some of these solutions and ethics and statistics that I would care if you guys yeah, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question, and actually a really timely question. And you may have noticed there are, some meteorologists have continued to do that. You know, many years ago, the same group, the Center for Climate Change Communication, found that, man, meteorologists in, in the community get, you know, they reach a large audience, and they're really influential in their communities. And, and some meteorologists have done that. Others have chosen not to. Just this past summer in Iowa, we had a meteorologist that left. Why? Because he started doing this. He was brought in from their affiliate to talk about climate change to clientele and was receiving death threats and decided to leave. He quit his job and he left. So, one thing I didn't show you is the topic still continues to be polarized, like a lot of topics right now, all right, in the United States. And so, that certainly, even though it's a personal can run the risk of, of having that type of um, hostility over what scientifically is highly credible. So it, it, I would say it's complicated. I, I think of, you know, talking to, I'm talking to a lot of meteorologists. Some of them prefer not to, some have embraced it and have started to do a lot of it. Yeah. Last one. Perfect. Was it Jeff Sanders who Well, all I say is in the winter, it's over 150 
our work and also to bring the next generation forward so that they also can work to protect our environmental benefits and land and to increase the educational aspects of preserving land. Tonight, um, I'm going to be emphasizing their vision and why it's so important. As I mentioned, um, from the very start, the vision included one, to develop a corridor protecting land between Clark and Green County. And to date, BW Greenway has currently conserved 25 properties totaling 725 acres of land by using Clean Ohio grant funds as well as private donations. BW Greenway does not only preserve land, but they work with landowners and park districts to restore the property. Uh, there have been many crews of honeysuckle removers out uh, many times during the year to restore very valuable property, as well as building and developing trails and boardwalks so that public has a better view of what, what the BW Greenway is protecting. In addition, the second vision is, as I mentioned previously, the importance of educating. And tonight, um, as a result of the person who has been involved with a very important education program, I feel the BW Greenway um, is a great recipient for this award. For the last 10 years, UW Greenway and the Fairborn Art Association has sponsored a jury art competition. Artists throughout the Miami Valley are invited to enter the contest to help artists to understand what the, the jury competition is all about. Um, each year, UW Greenway selects one of their protected pieces of property and arranges Tours so that artists can come out, go for a tour, learn what is valuable about the site, what kind of wildlife lives on the site, and what kind of plants are visible. As a city person, I have found these tours so important because, quite honestly, without a guide, one, I'd probably get lost, and two, I would not know the importance of one plant over another. So these tours are just so inspiring to the artists because they get to see not only the landscape, but they get to understand, understand and see all the components of the landscape. In 2023, we had 36 artists um, enter pieces, and we had a total of 66 pieces judged. Uh, it was overwhelming how beautiful the pieces and how appreciated they were by our visitors. At the opening reception, we had 75 people come to the Fairborn Art Association Gallery, and they spent the entire afternoon going from one picture to another, one painting to another, just looking at the scene and how valuable and beautiful it was. Additionally, the gallery was open for three additional Sundays in July, and we have people come from all kinds of communities who are aware of the juried art competition and really have just grown to expect every July to visit the Fairborn Art Association Gallery so they can see what the artists can produce. Um, so we just feel that this is a really unique way to educate the community with regard to the beauty that's out there in Green and Clark County in our preserved land. Many times people say, well, they can just read about it. But no, when they really create a piece of artwork and the public can enjoy it, it's, just, it's a great educational tool. Um, our founder for the art competition, I can't miss not mentioning, is Bob Coates. Um, Bob is a nationally known artist in Fairborn and art professor at Sinclair Community College. And it was his idea to create this contest and has always been 
uh, supported throughout the years to make sure we continue to grow. And we just feel that this is a real reason to um, have BW Greenway nominated and awarded tonight. And I greatly appreciate it.
being the father and the husband and his with his family. And that's one of the things that just so admired about him. He's just a wonderful, great co conspirator <laughs> as, I, as uh, Kate has just mentioned for us. So I've known that for many years and just been incredibly grateful for this honor. I want to give acknowledgments first to my husband. He is not able to join us, he's not here, but he's in the heavens. Give it a great smile and a thumbs up, waiting for him. And I really appreciate it because he was the impetus for this work. God just led me on a path of, of grief and uh, overcoming lots of pain and saying, you know, I have a purpose for you. And that purpose is going to not be in vain because it's also going to honor your life supporters and as we call each other, my husband. <laughs> so it's just great to do this work under the name of Daniel, just for me to care. I also with Doug, I've known for years. We've done this uh, work together in the community to serve families and the community. And right now, I'm just grateful for the opportunity of the things I've learned from him as I grow in this work with environmental justice. Anybody knows and knows he has this incredible passion for nature. And it's always been a joy to just share, talk, and um, do activities with him. He has uh, been a partner and colleague that I will just be eternally grateful for the relationship he developed. Um, I want to also share gratitude for those who traveled here to Yellow Springs this evening to support me. Yay, thank you. I really appreciate it and my heart swells with gratitude. Gratitude makes sense of our past and it also brings peace for today and it creates a vision for tomorrow. So I'm also incredibly grateful to the Zana for the Zana from the Partners for Environment. Although I want to say thank you for honoring my service, I'm really going to say for our service because it really took a team. And as I look at this room, it's really this quadrant, and I'm just from, I, you know, Pastor always taught me, don't say names, it'll get you in trouble. Because <laughs> you'll leave somebody out. So I'm just so grateful for so many people who just came alongside, supported, encouraged, prayed, took care of craziness to just help us get through this past year. It's been a journey, but been an incredibly fun and rewarding journey, and also a blessing for so many others. So I'm thankful for that. I also thought of, uh, well, Martin King says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. I do this work to serve the least, because it is the commandment and my calling. May we seek to join together, collaborate, and create a collective voice across this community and across this country to really continue to eliminate the disparities that many in our communities are experiencing. We can create justice where there's health inequities. And most importantly, may we seek equity for all families, children, and communities and may they have an opportunity to live in environmentally safe conditions that contribute to their health and not decrease their health.
Notice the only outdoor time their students were receiving involved blacktop surfaces. They asked their school if they could start taking these students to local parks for small field trips. As they took the kids to local parks, they were astounded at the lack of experience these children had with the outdoors. At the parks, they thought they were in a jungle or in a forest, because they had never experienced so many trees growing in one place together. The children were kind of fearful at first, but then they got excited about the bugs and the bird nests and cooking over an open fire. Again, this is the 70s. <laughs> so when they returned to the classroom, they were filled with excitement and enthusiasm and a new self-confidence. Dean Ryan and Sally Keyes were these two teachers, and these students were the inspiration for learning tree farm. Jean and Sally were also excited about the hands-on learning and the newfound sense of self-confidence and wonder it inspired in their students. They realized that they needed to help the students make connections in their natural world and show them where their food comes from and how things grow. The teachers recognized the difference that different people have in learning with different ways and some need that hands-on learning experience. And they wanted to provide something that children would never forget. Jean and Sally wanted to provide that outdoor setting where teachers could actually bring their students to experience an outdoor classroom. As they explored available locations, it became clear that a traditional farm with fields, woods, gardens, and barns would be the most available and appropriate setting for their new experiment. They began looking at farms, but they had no money at the time. So a group of friends and family members of Jean and Sally formed a partnership called Land Group 5, and they purchased a 55-acre farm as a long-term real estate investment, which they later donated back to <laughs> The farm would then be used as a classroom without walls with the mission to facilitate hands-on learning in a traditional farm setting. With volunteer efforts, improvements were made around the property and the teachers moved into the farmhouse in June of 1973 and began hosting field trip groups immediately. During the first year, Learning Tree Farm served approximately 200 children from local schools. As time went on, schools throughout the Miami Valley discovered the farm and began bringing classes from more than eight surrounding counties for an opportunity to experience our unique program. As attendance grew, more staff was needed and we and were brought on board and Jean and Sally were able to step away from their day-to-day -day duties on the farm. Their guidance and knowledge have been the cornerstone for all of our current programming. Now, in 2023, our field trips are at capacity as we provide field trips for over 9,500 children per year. Wow. 200 kids and 9,500. We welcome drop-in visitors, host community educational programming events, summer camp outreach, and so much more to a total of now 17,000 visitors last year just to Learning Tree Farm. So, but none of this would have been possible were it not for the seeds that were planted by Jean and Sally in 1973. Currently, while Jean and Sally are no longer in an official leadership role, they are the first call that we make for advice. They are our sounding board when we have any question about the reason behind what we do, and they are always available when called upon to help. Their enthusiastic spirit for giving children the gift of nature and hands-on experiences has been a driving force for our team and our board members, who continue to carry on the mission that they set forth 50 years ago. And their legacy continues to shine through every child who picks up a chicken, lifts up a rock, and tastes their first fresh vegetable. I am so honored tonight to be able to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to Jean, Ryan, and Sally Keith.
the award so and there's wrapping so you can take it home safely. Congratulations again. Let's give them another round of applause. and they recruit people to help them and they've just built so much um, powerful things in our community and I'm just constantly impressed when I hear these stories. So thank you for coming tonight, all of you, to honor them. Uh, just a few last thank yous and then we'll get you on your way home. Special thanks to four students who came, college students who came tonight to help us. We recruited Andrew and not the Andrew. Clay. Clay. They told me two Andrews were coming, and then a Clay came. Andrew and Clay from the University of Dayton. Let's give them a round of Michelle Burns for spying him one day and um, turning us on to awards that are you know nature themed but local artists we love to um, you know get that that part of our awards. Um, oh hey, the plants! Everybody should turn over their um, program. Turn it over your program. Do you have a pumpkin sticker on your program? You get to take a plant. Thank you.